Thank you. Oh, it, it is an honor to be with you guys this morning. Uh, we love this church, love Pastor Greg, Pastor Josh, and the whole team. Uh, as as uh, he mentioned there, that you guys helped launch us. Thank you so much for your investment in us. Uh, nine years ago now, um, and, and leaving a legacy in us. I do wanna take a moment and welcome all the campuses and everybody joining us online as well. Last I heard, I think you guys are up to like 94 campuses, so that's good for you guys. Really knocking out of the park. And I wanna welcome our newest campus, Seacoast Berlin. So uh, Herzlich Welkommen is how we would say that here. There, uh, is that not right? Did I mispronounce that? You don't have a Seacoast Berlin? That's awkward. Um, <laughs> 93 campuses isn't bad either, so we'll just, we'll go with that. Uh, before we go any further, can I get a selfie with y'all? That would be awesome, because nobody's gonna believe that I'm here. So if you guys could smile, campuses, if you could smile with us, that'd be great. Perfect, all right, thank you. That's just for my personal benefit. Um, you have no idea how much I have been looking forward to being on this stage. Uh, last time I was here, it was a first Wednesday. I remember as soon as I got done with the message, I walked right down to this seat. Pastor Greg was there, and he leaned over, and he said, home run, Ryan, home run. That was eight years ago, eight years ago. So I'm just glad he didn't say that was a double, because <laughs> it would have been 2058 before I got asked back. <laughs> but uh, I'm here, Greg, thank you. Eight years later, and uh, <laughs> it's good, whatever. I'm just a son of Seacoast. Um, my wife's joining me here today. She's uh, in the house with us. You can welcome her. That would be great. She's actually, uh, she's actually the reason we ended up at Seacoast 18 years ago. She was teaching at Wando High School. She was a theater teacher. Yeah, and uh, one of her students actually invited her. She went to the teacher's lounge and said, hey, I got invited to Seacoast. Should I go? And they said, absolutely not. It's a cult. <laughs> so... She bravely ventured out, uh, and we are, we are grateful that she did. Also brought my son, Gannon, he's nine, he's right over here with us as well. Uh, when we left to start our, uh, our church in Chattanooga, the net, he was two months old, so there's us in Park West packing up just down the road, getting ready to head out, and then uh, six years ago, uh, last week we had a daughter, so Callie, she's here with us as well, and uh, yeah, you can welcome her. She's up in the children's ministry right now. We told her, we said, hey, they got a playground in the church. <laughs> Mind blown, because we meet in a movie theater, and she's like, no way. So there we are uh, as a family, and my mom and dad are in the picture. Some of you know their story. They moved down to help us start the church in Chattanooga, and a year after, he had a severe car accident, which left him quadriplegic, and so uh, he's been trugging along for eight years now in that condition and doing great, he's my hero. They live with us now, so we're one big happy family and it's great. Uh, as far as the church is going, uh, we've got two campuses now. We've got our main campus in Chattanooga and we've started a second campus up in Cleveland, Tennessee, about 40 miles out and things are rocking and rolling. And then the last thing, thank you, yeah, it's been great. Some of them may be watching. Hopefully they've got their own service going on right now though, so that'd be good. Uh, and then the last thing I'll mention is I wrote a book since I was here last. I was really excited about that. Uh, I would tell you, you could pick up a copy in the bookstore, but I was over there and I, it appears they're out of, of <laughs> sold out. Um, that's all I can figure happen. Um, I, I saw Christine Kane's books there, Sean Wood's books, Naeem Fazel, Greg Surratt. Uh, but I, they're just between orders. It's fine. <laughs> Fortunately, you can get it on Amazon. So if no one else is going to help me, I'll help myself. <laughs> Stuck in the Middle, inspired by the 1973 classic, Clowns to the left of me, jokers to the right, here I am. You know it. Yeah, that's good. So, all right. So anyway, it's a book about journeying from one thing to another thing, and when you get stuck in the middle, uh, all the lessons in there are from uh, Hebrews 11 and my first experience as a soccer coach of my kids' upward league. Um, it was a very disappointing year, so it's a very encouraging book, uh, just so you know that somebody else is there with you. So you can pick that up, and um, that would be great, because we haven't even been able to pay the editor yet. So, <laughs> All right. Let's take a few minutes and let's talk about legacy, shall we? 
Show of hands, how many of you feel as though leaving a legacy is a daunting task? Anyone? A few of you? Yeah, several of you, good. Um, I break into a cold sweat when I think about legacy. Uh, I remember when I was on staff at Seacoast uh, reading a book by a guy named Bob Buford. Some of you may know him. He recently passed away. He was a friend of Greg's. But he had a book entitled Halftime, Moving from Success to Significance. Scared me to death. Because I was still getting used to the whole success thing. Like, I was just trying to do that, just trying to do something well. And then a book comes along and it tells you, no, now you have to be, you have to do something important. It's not just do it well, do it important. And then legacy starts popping up, this word. So now I don't have to do something well. Now I don't just have to do something important. I have to do something that people are going to remember long after I am gone. So it tires me just to think about all of that. And then the worst part is this, and this is where I want to hang out today, actually, as we talk. Because even if we can get past the magnitude of what's being asked of us, which is to leave a legacy, there's this additional thing, little minor detail that many of us contend with, which is many of us feel like we've already jeopardized the legacy. Can anyone relate to that? Some of you may have jeopardized the, le- jeopardized the legacy like this morning, like you on the way to church, you yelled at your children, it's like, oh, this is what they're gonna remember of me. So I wanna to talk to you about that because what inevitably happens is when we, when we experience this, we begin to think there's no way to turn the ship. There's no way to stop the cycle. There's no way to start over, begin again, or do something new. And that's the ironic part of that for me, I think, is that this, like the most central tenet of our faith is the resurrection of Jesus Christ and, and it's all about new beginnings. But oftentimes, we can, what can easily happen in the church and in the Christian faith is we, we readily accept that Jesus came back to life, but we forget that we can come back to life. In other words, we accept that the story works for him. Hey, he's Jesus. Of course, he could do that, but I'm not Jesus, so it doesn't work for me. And so my hope for you today, and just, just so you know where we're headed with the rest of our time together, is simply that you would begin to see that you can experience the resurrection for yourself, that it's not too late to leave a legacy. And how I plan to get you there today is first by telling you a story about a really big failure I had in my own life. And then I'm gonna follow that up with a lesson in ancient Jewish culture. And then I wanna talk about Jesus because he's a great example of someone who lived in ancient Jewish culture. And then after that, we're gonna talk about March Madness, lane closures, and World War II. So who's in? (laughs) Yeah, several years ago, we'll start with the story. Several years ago, I took all the money my wife and I had in savings, $70,000 from the sale of a house in Mount Pleasant, South Carolina. <laughs> okay. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> Somebody probably bought it right here. And then 30,000 we had accumulated over time due to uh, a guy named Dave Ramsey, who some of you are familiar with. Yeah, so uh, $100,000, I took all of that, all of that, and I invested it into the stock market. Well, let me rephrase that. I divested it into the stock market. (laughs) Because by the time all was said and done, I had lost all $100,000. In fact, I remember not long after it happened, I was was here when I was for First Wednesday, and I I was uh, meeting with Greg in the back room and uh, just sharing my heart about everything that had happened. And his response was, oh boy. And then he consoled me, and and we moved on. He pulled me off the ledge. It was good. But I think the question I normally get asked uh, is, how do you lose $100,000? And the answer is slowly over time, where each decrease in value leads a person to invest more aggressively in a desperate hope of gaining back what they've lost. And the problem with doing that, of course, is, personal example here, is that you get absorbed in what you're trying to accomplish. And it doesn't just affect your finances, it, it begins to affect your mind and your emotions. And you really, it, 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 it keeps you from functioning properly. And so it just sucks you in. It's probably a lot like what a person would experience if they were addicted to something. So it just takes over. And it was an awful experience. It took years to recover from. Uh, required a lot of grace on the part of my wife. But having said all of that, not too long ago, my son started inquiring about the stock market. He wanted to know what it was and how it worked. And so reluctantly, I began to share with him what I know, knew, mostly what I didn't know. Um, And then he asked the question I feared most. Hey, Dad, can I buy some stock? 
Now, initially, as you can imagine, I was reluctant. I was afraid. I was afraid, one, that I would get sucked back into this. I was afraid, two, that he would repeat the same mistakes I had made, and that isn't the legacy I wanted to leave. But then I thought, maybe if I could do this with him, I can teach him how to do it differently, and so I agreed. And at first, everything was fine. He, he would ask for my phone at, at the end of the day, and he'd say, Daddy, can I just see where my stock closed? And I'd say, yeah, here it is, and we'd just look at it. But then the stock started to move with more volatility, and he became more intrigued and wanted to see it with more frequency. And so it went from, where, where, does, where did it close, Dad, to, hey, Dad, it's 9.30, the market just opened, can I see where my stock is? <laughs> hey, Dad, it's 9.31, can I see where it's moved in the last 60 seconds? And, and so it just... If that wasn't enough, then all that's going on. One day, I find him at the lower level of my house where my parents live, watching Fox Business Channel with my dad. <laughs> the ticker tape's going. He's like, Dad, look at the green, look at the green, look at the green. I said, yeah, look at the red, look at the red, look at the red. And at this point, it started to bother me because I was seeing glimpses of what had happened to me happen to him. At the same time, though, he was doing really well. My son had found a stock that had gone up 60% inside of three months. Can somebody say Vegas? <laughs> but then it started to pull back, and it pulled back some more. And he got down to around where he was even again, and then overnight there was, there was fraud allegations that came out about the company, and overnight it had dropped 40%. And I wish you could have seen his little face in that moment. Like, he was just... I think it would help you understand what, what I was experiencing in that moment internally because, like it just, one, it broke my heart just to see him so devastated, but he was now more obsessed than ever. I was seeing him get sucked in as I had gotten sucked in because now he was watching his money do what I had watched my money do disappear. And even though it was him and not me, it may as well have been me because it felt like it was happening all over again. It was like a, a relapse. My worst nightmare was coming true. My son was reliving all of my mistakes. The thing I was most afraid of seeing happen was happening. This was now the legacy I was leaving. And some of the thoughts that started going through my mind in that moment were things like, maybe, maybe I'm not a, as far along as I, I think I am. Maybe I haven't recovered from this. Maybe, and this is just where my mind went, maybe, maybe all of life is on repeat. Where like the, the, the junk I have just kind of gets passed to him and, and I'm never gonna be able to break this cycle. I'm, I'm gonna ruin him. Maybe, maybe I'll never get free. Maybe, maybe the story will never be able to change because apparently what has always been will always be, which begin to sound very reminiscent of something I've read numerous times in the Bible from the book of Ecclesiastes. You may know this passage. What has been will be again. What has been done will be done again. There's nothing new under the sun. In fact, that's what Solomon says, is there anything of which one can say, look, this is something new? Have you ever felt that way before? Have you ever felt that there's nothing new under the sun? Maybe you're caught in a generational thing or you're passing on a generational thing and it just, it feels like it's just continuing down the cycle. This is the script, I've, I, I, I always have lived this. I always know this is, this is how it's gonna be. It's like, it's like your life is on this like, free Spotify playlist that you didn't pay for and you just keep getting songs you don't want, right? Yeah, because what's been, well, it'll be done again. Nothing new. Now, interesting thing about this idea, though, particularly as it pertains to this passage, this wasn't a new idea when Solomon wrote this. In fact, you, you can read, a, I read a book by a guy named Thomas Cahill. It's called Gift of the Jews, How a Tribe of Desert Nomads Changed the Way Everyone Thinks and Feels. Great book, great book. It's on Amazon too. It's not in your bookstore. <laughs> but in the book, Cahill talks about how in ancient times nearly all civilizations viewed life not as linear but cyclical. And a lot of that had to do with what they had observed. They'd see seasons come and seasons go. But then they took it beyond nature and they just start to, started to believe this is, this is how life works for us. Like it's not just seasons that are on repeat, we are on repeat. Like we're born, we live, we die, and the whole living part, it's all the same. So like you, if you were alive in that time, you just would do what your parents did. They did what their parents did. You lived in the same place, all the same norms and values of your tribe just kept getting passed down, passed down, because what has been will always be. 
There's nothing new under the sun. Now, the irony, though, of King Solomon grabbing this concept and, and putting it to paper is that he was affirming a view that wasn't congruent with where the Jewish people were. Because the Jewish people were the, really the only people at their time who were breaking free from this idea. The Jews didn't believe that time was cyclical. And one of the places you see this actually is early in their story. Uh, Abraham, who's regarded as the forefather of the Hebrew nation, he's having a conversation with God in the book of Genesis. And uh, it's a fairly brief conversation, but it goes like this. The Lord had said to Abram, go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. And then verse four says, so Abram went. Now, if you were reading a one-year Bible and you got to this point early in January, you would probably just skim right over it. What's the big deal? No big deal, right? A guy moved away from home. Woohoo! we do that all the time, right? Not in that time. Not in that time. Why didn't they? Because there's nothing new under the sun. It's just not what you do. You don't venture out. But now suddenly there was this new thing happening. Suddenly this guy named Abram decided to go find a new life and go do his own thing. And the whole system was now being challenged by him. And for the Jewish people, it would continue to be challenged because later Moses would lead the children of Israel out of Egypt and then Joshua would lead them into the promised land because for the Jews, time was linear, not cyclical. We can move into a new thing. And they just kept moving forward. But unfortunately, by the time Solomon comes along, this idea that we can move forward takes a backseat to an old idea that we can't change. And here's the reason. At this point in Israel's history, they were established. They had their own land. They had their own temple. They'd gone as far as they thought they could go. Solomon was considered the wisest man to have ever lived. He had done everything that you could do under the sun, which is important to understand because what that means is when Solomon says this, when he says what has been will be done again, there's nothing new under the sun. He's not saying it because it's necessarily true. He's saying it because he's stuck. Now, what's interesting about that then is that that mindset, how it begins to affect people years later, because when you get to the first century where Jesus is found, you see this view still present in the Jewish people. In fact, you actually see it in the disciples. Mostly as Jesus' ministry is winding down, because on the front end of his ministry, the disciples think he's the next Moses. Moses led us out of Egypt. He freed us from the Egyptians. Jesus is gonna free us from the Romans. But as the story moves forward, you begin to realize and they begin to realize that Jesus doesn't have any interest in that. He's actually up to something else. And so at this point, the disciples work to just keep Jesus from getting things stirred up. So I'll give you an example of one place where you see this. It's John 11, just to set up the passage. Jesus has decided to go back to an area that he had previously been at where he had run into some problems uh, with some of the religious leaders of, of his day. But at this point, he wants to go back because he wants to connect with some of his old friends. And so the disciples, when they find out what Jesus is planning, they say this. His disciples object. Rabbi, um, only a few days ago, the people in Judea were trying to stone you. Are you sure you want to go there again? In other words, like, listen, Jesus, we're all about going to war if we're going to overthrow the Romans. But if that's not in the cards, we should probably just lay low. And here's why they were saying that. They'd seen this script before. They knew what happened to guys who claimed to be the Messiah but failed to lead a successful revolution. They got killed. No one remembered them. There was no legacy. And so this is what's gonna happen to Jesus if we don't stop him because after all, there's nothing new under the sun. Can you see the mindset still present in the disciples? In fact, had you told the disciples that Jesus was going to die and come back to life, which Jesus tried to tell them over and over again, that was, what, that was the game plan, they would have said, no, 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 that's, that's not possible. People don't do that. That's not how things work. Until it did work. Until it did happen. But then again, that was Jesus. And you're not Jesus. Jesus. So the real question is, not can Jesus come back to life? Can you come back to life? Can you turn the ship? Can you stop the cycle? Can you start over? Can you begin again? Can you do something new? 
Can you do something different than what has always been done? Is there something new under the sun, even if you're not Jesus, even today? To answer that, we have to talk about March Madness. <laughs> we'll call this story number one. How many of you follow college basketball, by the way? Any of you? Fans? Yeah? How many of you do the brackets? Some of you, yeah? How many got it right this year? Anybody know it? See my son's hand is up? 60% in the stock market in three months, I'm telling you, okay? Vegas, okay, so anyway, if you follow it, you know these guys, okay? Now, if you don't know these guys, it's fine. Before March 16th, nobody knew these guys, okay? <laughs> After March 16th, a different story. Uh, this is UMBC, they're the Golden Retrievers, and uh, they were one of four number 16 seeds in the tournament going against the number one teams in the tournament. There's four brackets, four 16s, four ones, and they face off in the first round. Now, if you don't know anything about March Madness, and next year somebody says, hey, would you like to pick a bracket? Let me just, a bit of advice. You never, you never pick a 16 to be a one because it, prior to this year, had never happened, ever. In fact, here's an article written by a reporter of NCAA.com website dated March 15th, one day before UMBC played the top team in the nation, University of Virginia. March Madness, is this the year a number 16 seed can finally dethrone a number one seed in the NCAA tournament? There are underdogs, there are ginormous, ginormous underdogs, and then there are number 16 seeds in the NCAA tournament. History says they're on a suicide mission. Shouldn't we recognize this year's fearsome foursome before they leap into the shark tank? Here's the team picked Finish, pick to finish seventh in its own conference, the Radford Highlanders. Next up, Villanova. Here's the team whose coach has already understood how to wreck a bracket, Penn and Steve Donahue, who in an earlier Ivy League took Cornell to the Sweet 16. Next up, Kansas. Here's to the ultimate Cinderella, a team with a 16 and 19 record, South, uh, Texas Southern. Next up, Xavier. And then here's to the team whose leading score graduated with a double major, still has a season of eligibility, eligibility eligibility, and didn't transfer to a bigger fish like so many do, UMBC and the stay the course, Jarius Lyles, next up, Virginia. Now, here he goes on, he says, they all know the score. They all know the number two, it's zero and 132. That's the all-time record of number 16s against number one. But it gets more depressing. Of those 132 losses, 89 were by at least 20 points, 47 by at least 30 points, only 16 by single digits, and only seven of those in the past 27 years. So gladiators, we salute you. You are being asked to defy the past. The odds defy logic. At one point, he calls their chance of winning a miracle. In other words, no chance whatsoever, because let's face it, some things are as they've always been, or at best, some things only work if you're Jesus. But not this time. Not this time, because not only did UMBC do the impossible and beat Virginia, y'all, and some of you know this, they did it in style by defeating them 74 to 54. They beat them by the same margin of victory that two-thirds of other 16 seed teams lost by throughout history, 20 points. Totally unexpected, by the way. In fact, I watched their second round game. Uh, they lost that one only by seven to Kansas State, who went to the Elite Eight, so like, it, was, it wasn't a bad run. But I watched that game and I heard the announcer say that the UMBC players didn't have anything to wear the day after they won the game because they only packed one outfit. <laughs> it's like they didn't even expect they were gonna win. I'm good, mom, just pack one pair, I'll be back tomorrow. <laughs> and yet they did something that had never been done before in the history of the world. They broke the cycle. They proved to everyone that life isn't on repeat. Or we might say it this way, they gave evidence that something new under the sun can happen even today. Story number two, lane closures. Just outside my neighborhood, they were doing some road work not too long ago. It's the kind of road work where they close one lane and they have to stop traffic so the other guys can come around. You know what I'm talking about? You're there like 30 minutes, where you're like, are we ever gonna get our turn? You know that? You hate that, right? I, I used to hate that. I used to hate that until I came across this guy. 
This is Gabriel, by the way, named after the archangel. <laughs> Which you may be saying to yourself, why? Why has this dude got a picture of a road worker? Like, how did he get that? Let me tell you how he got that, okay? This dude, first of all, is like no other flagger I've ever met before. Most guys who do this job just, they do this. You've seen them, right? You're like, wow, that must, thank you God I don't have that job, right? <laughs> Except Gabriel. You come up on his stop and Gabriel's gone. <laughs> so it was too much for me. I had to know more, I had to know more. So I, I pull off on the side of the road one day. I go walk back to Gabriel. I was like, dude, I just gotta know, what are you listening to? Because he had earbuds, right? But turns out they weren't in his ears. <laughs> He's like, I'm not listening to anything, dude. I just got a song in my head. <laughs> what song? <laughs> now, time out. Before I tell you what song, let me, let me just tell you what else happened. Because Gabriel talked my ear off that day. Gabriel apparently doesn't get much company doing his job. <laughs> so he proceeds to tell me that in, in addition to doing traffic directs it, he also moonlights as a drummer. And not just any drummer. No, 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 no. Gabriel is the drummer of a Christian heavy metal rock band called Faith Head. <laughs> so like, I look him up right there. I look him up. And, and they sound like this. <laughs> Jesus! Jesus is awesome! Jesus! <laughs> It's like, yeah, and I'm thinking what you're, th I'm like, I need more faith head in my life, you know? <laughs> that and cowbell, apparently, I don't know. <laughs> now, with that information, then let's go back to the song that's in Gabriel's head as he's directing traffic that day. I ask him, what are you, what, what, what's going on up there? And, and he says, furry lease. Some of you don't know Furry Lee. It goes like this. Yeah, so here. In other words, a heavy metal rock band drummer is directing traffic to the beat of a song by Beethoven. <laughs> now, I don't know what you've seen in your lifetime, but I'm pretty sure this dude is brand new territory. In fact, he's not only new territory, but because of him, when my lane finally opened, I was sad. Have you ever been sad that you don't get stuck in traffic? <laughs> I, I wanted my Gabriel. I wanted my orchestra conductor, which then all serves as this great big reminder that once again, something new under the sun can happen even today. Story number three. Oh, that guy. Early stages of... World War II. The British people were not in favor of the British going to war against the Germans. No way, no how. They, they, they're actually still reeling from the effects of World War I. It had been close enough to them that they were still feeling that. So public sentiment was not where the military leadership nor the world at large wanted it to be. They just didn't want another war. Around that same time, a rabbi named Abraham Mordecai Alter had been rescued from a ghetto in Warsaw and was invited by Winston Churchill to meet and discuss how to best bring about the downfall of Germany. At one point during the discussion, the rabbi says, as I see it, Prime Minister, <laughs> there are two possibilities. One involves natural means and one involves supernatural means. Now, the natural means would be if a million angels with flaming swords descended on Germany. <laughs> the supernatural means would be if the Englishman parachuted down on Germany and destroyed it. <laughs> Guess which happened? Yeah, the Englishman descended on Germany. In other words, it was the supernatural. It was the thing no one thought could ever happen in the history of the world. It was the new thing. See, we think we can't do anything to break the cycle. 
We think our shot at leaving a legacy is over because we've been down this road. We know where it leads. We can't turn the ship. We can't stop the cycle. We can't start over. We can't begin again. We can't do something new. Unless, of course, you're Jesus, then miracles happen. But here's what we miss in all of that. We miss the point of the resurrection. Because let me tell you why Jesus didn't come back to life. Jesus didn't come back to life to show off. He didn't come back to impress you. It wasn't Jesus saying, look at me, look, I can do what no one else can do. No. You know how we know that? We know that because he told us as much. John 14, 12. I tell you the truth, anyone who believes in me will do the same works I have done in what? Even greater. More. You will be able to come alive in ways that haven't even been conceived yet. In fact, truth be told, and this is gonna sound strange, I'm a pastor, this is gonna sound really strange. The resurrection of Jesus wasn't that miraculous, y'all. Because the idea that a God who created everything could die and come back to life, well, Rabbi Alter might say it this way, that's the most natural thing in the world. But here's something that would be supernatural. Here's something that would be miraculous if you would start to believe the same thing could happen in you through him. Because here's why Jesus really came back to life. He came to show you it could be done. He came to show you what's possible. Because the truth is, new things are happening all around you all the time. And where the resurrection of Jesus gets interesting is when you step into it and you become part of it. It's when you start to believe that that the legacy has not been written yet because you can turn the ship, you can stop the cycle, you can start over, you can begin again, you can do something new under the sun, even today. Let's pray. Father, we come before you this morning. Oh, my prayer for each and every one of us is that we would just grab hold of this truth that, that there, is, there is the good news there is the good news that Jesus died and he rose and he's, he's seated at the right hand of the Father and he, he intercedes on our behalf. But then there's, there's this great news that's tucked within the good news, which is that we get to live again with him. That the resurrection can happen in us. And so my prayer for us today, as, as a church, whatever campus we're at, if we're watching online, if we're here in the house today in Mount Pleasant, that that we would begin to believe again that a different legacy is possible, that we can, we can go in a new direction, that life doesn't have to be on repeat, that the things that we experienced yesterday, they can be our yesterdays and not our todays, that the thing we even experienced this morning, that it can change, that tomorrow is a new day and a new decision and a new opportunity and a new way of life, that we, can step into. Help us to embrace that truth today. In your name we pray, amen. So let me give you the end of the story that I started with. My son's losing money as fast as I lost money. Things are going down quickly. I'm distraught, I feel like this is is it, this is it, repeat. Here we go again. And there's just kind of this seed of something in me that said, he still has something left. It's not much, but there's something there. Maybe, maybe, we, can, maybe we can do something with this. So I sat him down. It was just, it was this, it was like this divine moment. I remember, I remember exactly in the living room where I was, I just kind of resolved to, Gannon, come over here, let's talk for a minute, buddy. I sat him down on the couch, I said, listen, It really looks bad, I've researched the company, the allegations look like they're true, I don't think this is gonna come back. Here's the thing, you're you're probably never gonna get back to where you were with this investment. So we can take what you have and move into something else, or you can just ride this out and see where it goes, but it may not go well. Now this is the moment at which I stayed in and the ship went down for me. My son looks at me and he says, I think I want to get out, Dad. (sighs) Yeah. Okay, buddy, let's do it. 
Let's get you out of this. Let's move on to something better. Resurrections aren't just for Jesus. Because I'm gonna tell you what God wants more than anything is he wants to see you come back to life. He wants to see your story change. And so how I would like to see us respond today at all campuses, and we have the stations here. We, we do this at the net that we picked up from you guys, and it's just such a beautiful opportunity to, to respond and express what we feel seated in our heart from the message that we've heard. And so I'm gonna give you a couple, couple things. One is the cross is available to you guys. Now here's, here's, here's how the cross fits into all of that. Jesus talks repetitively in, in his words through the Gospels. The New Testament, Paul talks endlessly about if we're, gonna, if we're gonna share in his life, we have to first share in his death. So like, to move into the new thing, you first have to let go of the old thing, you get that? Like my son, he, like, I gotta sell it before I can move on. I gotta walk away from something to move into something else. And so for you today, it may be that you go to the cross, you write out the thing that you're gonna put to rest so that you can move into life. I also wanna give you an opportunity to do communion, same thing. Communion is a reminder of the death, the sacrifice of Jesus, the body and blood. We die so that we can live. And so if you go to a station today, you're gonna see a piece of bread, you can take that, you can dip it in the juice and eat it and be reminded of the sacrifice, be reminded of the death, but also be reminded that that death was necessary to usher in new life. And that today, as you take part in that you are also moving through the stages of death to life. You can live again. Let's respond.